extremely rad walk on music. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so good afternoon, everyone. I know that we're after lunch, but I suspect that this topic is a topic um, that will wake everyone up. Um, I, just before I start, has, where's the QR code? There's meant to be a QR code, amazing. So there, if you need translation, um, if you scan the QR code, there will be closed captioning available to you. So please do that if you need it. Um, my name is Abele Okobi. Uh, I am the CEO of The New Humanitarian. This is my second week in the job, so, uh, <laughs> so, so um, if I make mistakes, don't blame my company. It is me. I can only blame myself. Um, but I'm really pleased to be here to, talk, to, have, to discuss this incredibly um, timely and incredibly important topic that has obviously global Im implications. I'm delighted to be joined by two colleagues here and also one colleague who will be joining us on phone. Um, so I have Gareth Owen from Save the Children. Though you've seen his bio, his legend precedes him, um, so I won't <laughs> go through it. Um, and then we also have Jason Hart, who's a professor of humanitarianism and development at Bath University. And then we have Hadil Khazaz. I don't see Hadil. Hello, Hello Hadil. Um, thank Hi. you so much for joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to having a really um, interesting and provocative conversation. So I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction, and then we'll start. The other thing is um, we're hoping to leave time at the end for questions, um, uh, and also from questions from here, and also questions that will come in here. Um, uh, if not, I apologize in advance, but we do hope to have a really um, uh, lively debate. So the scale of death and destruction that Israel is perpetuating in Gaza has been described by many sources as unimaginable. The numbers of children that are being killed and maimed are in multiple thousands. Entire lineages have been wiped out. Israel has targeted and killed more journalists since October than the entire number killed in America's war against Vietnam. There are now 1.3 million people trapped with no access to water or electricity or food while being aerially bombarded. While the world watches and dithers on whether to call it a genocide, one of the reported casualties is faith in international rule of law. As the rules that certain countries, like the US, like Germany, like the UK, like France, have claimed to live by, the rules that they have previously described as separating good slash Western countries from bad slash everywhere else um, are being seen to be flouted with impunity. So our conversation is what that means today for humanitarianism going forward. So even before Israel's current siege, 80% of Gazans relied on international humanitarian aid for survival, according to the UN. But under international law, it's the occupying power's responsibility to provide food, shelter, medicine, and other essential needs. Jason, have aid agencies historically let Israel off the hook by failing to challenge the very thing that creates the need for aid in the first place? That is the occupation. I would say absolutely yes, they have failed. And um, it's, it reveals a profound problem within the field of humanitarianism where organizations are trying to hold together on one hand support for people who are suffering and on the other hand trying to appease donors in the quest for funds mm. and I think those two things have sat in a very in a tremendous tension for many many years many decades and we've seen it very clearly in Gaza and I think we've now seeing the playing out of the impossibility of trying to do that and the need for humanitarians to profoundly rethink and reorient themselves and the ways that they operate and their reliance on donors, their acceptance of silencing by donors, whether it's, and now of course we're talking increasingly about corporates, mm. so corporate agendas coming on board mm. as well as the agendas of, as we've seen in particular, the US and its Western allies. So in terms of my own work, and I've worked for many years on child protection and recently completed a research project looking at the protection of children in Gaza, funded by the FCDO, it was initially funded by DFID, mm. funded by the FCDO, and I feel I ended that project and look back on it now and think, what a joke, what a joke. The FCDO funded me to do that research on protection of children, and the children involved in our research project our partners helping us with the research project have been killed, have been slaughtered in Gaza with the help of our government. And this is an untenable situation. It should cause us all to rethink how humanitarian organizations have positioned themselves and what profoundly needs to change. I want to get back to this question about what profoundly needs to change. But before I get to that, Gareth, if decades of humanitarian response in the region have failed Palestinians thus far, 
I think many people are saying that it has, but halting that aid would be catastrophic, as other people say, then how should aid agencies pivot? You're describing the age-old humanitarian dilemma. And I think, um, in my experience, there is something very unique about how this situation plays out on the humanitarian psyche. And I think it's because of the starkness that the situation throws. Thro throw, it's, the, it's how stark it is when you try and resolve what you're experiencing from a sort of classical humanitarian philosophy perspective. Mm -hmm. And so the dilemma, of course, is you know, to, to act or not to act. Mm -hmm. For Save the Children, our engagement dates back to 1949. Mm -hmm. So we've been around this, this, this situation you know, for a very long time. And we tend to hold back when you know, the, the situation goes into you know, a conflagration like we've seen, because we know that we have to be very measured mm -hmm. and we, are, we have to navigate our way through awful dilemmas. And so the practice of kind of subjective humanitarian wisdom on the part of leaders is incredibly fraught. So I, I say to staff who engage with the situation, it will change you. And they invariably tell me, yes, mm -hmm. you know, it has changed me. And I think that's because you know, the humanitarian band-aid might stem the bleeding, mm. but it's not the justice that heals the wound. Mm. So, you know, we constantly wrestle with that problem. I want to come back to this question of justice versus uh, aid, but before that, Hadil, I have a question for you. Um, there's no question that many of the more than five million Palestinians in the occupied Gaza Strip and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, need help including an estimated 2.8 million registered Palestinian refugees. But this money has been distributed in an environment of consistent human rights violations and collective punishment with little pushback, or I mean, pushback has, me has been measured from aid groups or, and specifically from donors. This means that aid has done very little to counter the conditions, namely Israel's crippling occupation and blockade that make it necessary. So should there be a role for humanitarian organizations or community in insisting, insisting that governments funding humanitarian action do likewise? So should, should, should aid organizations intervene? I know you described yourself as being measured. Um, should aid organizations do more? Hadil. Yes, uh, thank you so much. This is a very good question and it's a, a topic that many Palestinians and many international scholars have been discussing. A humanitarian aid, by definition, is supposed to be temporary and is supposed to help people to help themselves. Uh, what we have seen over the years in Palestine that aid actually increased dependency, reduced, for example, the residents in the Gaza Strip uh, to um, become more of uh, aid dependent, more than 80% of the population in Gaza before October 7 were totally dependent on aid and they were using aid to survive. Um, in, in the time that for over 16 years where Gaza was under siege, was uh, uh, closed, nobody could actually do any political accountability work, couldn't hold the occupation accountable for their responsibilities. Uh, the aid at the same time, you would imagine that aid increased. Actually, no, it didn't increase. It decreased from being almost 27% of the um, GDP of the Gaza Strip to less than 3%. This is $2 billion dollars of aid in 19 uh, uh, just uh, before the blockade 2008 until 2022 it was 500 uh, 50 million dollars only but this is was to just to keep people alive now what's happening is a danger not only for palestinians and for gaza it's a danger for the way that the world is seeing aid it's a, a, a decreasing confidence in the global world order, decreasing confidence in humanitarian, humanitarian organizations, decreasing confidence in a possibility of solution, smashing any talk that we had over the years about the triple nexus, about resilience, about 
ability for people to bounce back. And it's such a huge, a huge loss for all the aid that was bombed into the Palestinians' uh, communities and societies trying to build them, where they were totally destroyed, not only now, but also for the future. Mm -hmm. So it's also destroying the possibilities of uh, reviving and the possibilities of going back to where they were before uh, the war started. This is a huge danger for all of us, anyone who's concerned about uh, having a certain um, world peace and balance uh, or thinking about the possibility of humanity. Uh, this is a huge, a huge danger for uh, the work we do as humanitarians and how we can actually present ourselves without respect of accountability and human rights. I don't think any humanitarian work can succeed. No. Um, I'm curious, Jason, would, what would you say to the question of whether or not aid is enabling the occupation? Well, yes, it absolutely has been innate. And this is the kind of the double-edged sword, in a sense, of should aid agencies pull out and, and make Israel more directly accountable, as they, as they are under the Fourth Geneva Convention, but do you actually push them to do that? Because as things stand, I mean, Israel, Israeli government has a kind of ambiguous relationship to humanitarian organizations in as much as if they weren't there, they may have to actually do much more, potentially. They may be held accountable yep. to some extent um, in a way that they, they aren't presently. But on the other hand, you know, are humanitarian organizations propping up occupation and settler colonialism and now genocide? I mean, I think, I think the situation is so serious that for me, unless something really profound changes, I think humanitarian organizations commit themselves to a future where they are walking with a bucket behind US and its allies behind military just cleaning up the mess after genocide. Mm. That's what it will be reduced to. I mean, you can see it already happening. It has happened in small ways, but Gaza has just shown us, I think, that this is a, this is a charade. Yeah. Quite frankly, that's a charade. And I'm sorry to say I've seen these organizations grow over years. It's an industry. Everybody's fighting for funding. But where is the question about what is the moral responsibility? The humanitarian principles have been largely ignored by many humanitarian organizations. When they do talk about it, they talk about neutrality and they use neutrality or their interpretation of neutrality basically to excuse themselves for taking the stand on the basis of principle. The principle of independence we never talk about, but is absolutely fundamental. Humanitarian organizations, for the most part, are entirely dependent on governmental donors, increasingly on corporate donors, on all kinds of narrow self-interests. And that has to change. And if that means the organizations get smaller, they get more focused, then maybe that's the direction to go in. But simply seeking to sustain the status quo after Gaza is not only untenable, it's profoundly immoral. I'm curious, Gareth, what would you say to that? Yeah. Um, I think in terms of organizations, we, we don't really know the implications of what we're seeing fully yet. Mm. And I think that's partly because we are focused on attempting to save lives and uh, advocating very heavily for a ceasefire. Mm. And so when I look at the situation, uh, you know, I, I, I hear everything that is being said, but my first instinct is humanity, humanity, humanity. And I think of the words of uh, Pierre Gaillard, who was the head of the ICRC delegation in Rwanda in 1994. You know, our role is to inject, attempt to inject a measure of humanity into situations that simply should not exist. So, and there's another quote that comes to mind, which is from the play, The History Boys, by Alan Bennett, which is, uh, there's nothing so distant as the recent past. And the, and the point being that it's difficult to put things into their into their kind of historical context. But it's fairly obvious that we are experiencing a monumental failure of humanity and internationalism. Um, and what you find also, there's another quote from that play which comes to mind, which is about um, we put things into context in order to explain them, but in the explaining, they can be explained away. Mm. There is no explaining away the loss of so much life, the loss of 12,000 children, be they children in Israel or children in the West Bank or children in Gaza. There's no explaining away 12,000 dead children. 
Yeah, and, and obviously your focus is children, and I think we have to focus on everyone. And I think one of the narratives around it is that some deaths are more um, valid than others. And I think in this, it's an it's important conversation to, to, to bring in that all deaths, um, that all destruction is, is equally valid. Hadil, I wanted to bring you in because um, Jason talked about change and, or radical change. And, and given the situation that we're seeing, one of the questions is how high is the bar? Like, what are the triggers that should change, that should um, provoke radical change. So in your mind, do you think we are at a place where we should be thinking about radical change when it comes to the humanitarian sector? And specifically, do you think that that requires a fundamental rethinking of the relationship to dominant humanitarian donors, who in this case are often um, uh, precipitating the violence that they then seek to, um, to mitigate? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it is also um, one of the challenges that I personally find is the ability of holding the humanitarian donors accountable to what they believe in. And that's a question that I we have been asked as an INGO working in a humanitarian uh, work. The people will ask, how do you match between what you do and the government that view this funding. And I, that's a dilemma. This is a, a, a huge global democracy question where uh, these governments are supposed to be responding to their citizens. And there is an overwhelming majority of citizens around the world actually uh, understanding and realizing that this is a humanitarian crisis. And they are demanding their governments to do something and to stop uh, funding the war, to stop providing uh, weapons and f warfare. There are millions of people who go to the streets almost every day asking for change and not nothing is happening. So while we as I, as NGOs that are working in the field, we are accountable. We have to submit certain uh, checks and balances. We have to improve so many in so many ways that there's no uh, uh, diversion, that we are accountable, that we are transparent. The governments who have a global commitment to humanitarian support, they are not meeting their uh, role of becoming accountable to their own citizens and to responding to the demand. This is not only a huge democratic crisis, but also a huge uh, a discrepancy between uh, what they are expected and supposed to do and what they are reaching for. And we... I am one person who advocated all my life, for example, for human rights and women's rights. And then everyone asks me, but where are human rights in what's happening here now? How we can respond to this? Uh, that's why I said initially it's a confidence and a crisis confidence and a trust confidence in what we believe in and what we have been advocating for all our lives. But also it is a question for the communities and for the people in the West about their governments and how they ha can hold their governments accountable first before the, uh, their governments can hold the occupation accountable. This is a chain of building trust, and that's something that is required for the future, a chain of rebuilding uh, the world in a, in a different way where there is a, a series of uh, um, checks and balances that are not only looking into the victims and the more vulnerable and the marginalized, but also look into how decisions are made and who decides. Um, there was a mention for the corporate trolls. And then uh, again, this is something that is usually legalized and designed by the governments, uh, uh, how to hold corporates accountable. Uh, this they have to be accountable as much as governments are accountable. And that's another whole debate and issue of who's um, funding and sponsoring uh, uh, certain uh, warfares and how we can stop them. And that's that's very, very important for any humanitarian interaction. Uh, also, what we are missing, I think, in the debate uh, a little bit is the future. Because uh, the, the challenge of uh, how this war is not only affecting the people who are alive now and can die at any moment. There is no space that is safe in Gaza and everyone has been crying. There is uh, a famine that is going on, etc. But there is also the next generation that 
is being debriefed of their rights of living. And the, the, the future generation, not only in Gaza and not only in, in the occupied Palestinian territory, but around us in the region and globally, because we are debriefing them of uh, their um, possibilities of, uh, of life and of trusting a system where human rights is respected and where they can live in dignity. And we also witness uh, um, destruction of the environment that will affect also their access to water and their access to clean air and will contribute to the global warming and all of these things that have, we have been also a uh, warning of. So that's why holding governments accountable is very important as well as um, making sure that the voices of the people is he heard globally, not only here, not only the cries of children and women in the Gaza Strip, but also these people who are speaking in the streets and asking for justice and for respect of human rights. Thank you so much. Gertie, what do you think? Yeah, I think this is a profoundly important point that's been made about you know, the sort of global dimension. Okay, we're, of course we're focused on what's happening in Gaza, but the implications, the structural limitations of the aid system, the formal system are well known, mm. you know, um, and it's almost as if one long lifetime since the end of the Second World War, collective humanity has forgotten why we built institutions of international humanitarian diplomacy mm. to rid future generations of the scourge of warfare after 50 million people were killed. Have we forgotten why we did that? Mm. Um, so uh, there's something about institutional reality in a formal system that's made up of institutions, mm. which is deeply inadequate. What gets ingrained in institutional behaviour repeats. It just grinds on. And what's ingrained in the institution debate, uh, the critique that uh, Jason has been pointing to, is real. It's risk aversion, it's compliance obsession, um, and it's inadequate. And so the reason, part of the reason why we're here today, and part of honouring the truth it would be an injustice not to talk about Gaza on a day like this, is to appeal, I think, to everybody who's listening, everybody who's in the room, look, look beyond institutions. Mm. Yes, they will have to reform, but they've had a long time and a lot of attempts at it. It's slow and it's inadequate. So there's something about while that process continues, that we have to look beyond institutions to creative, broad alliances for change that are much more based on the kind of thing that's being talked about in relation to the hum reclaiming of the human soul. That is a more hopeful version of events for me mm. and why we're here today, in all honesty. So, um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't think we have forgotten about why the international rule-based rule order was brought in after the Second World War. We, what we haven't done is, that, is sufficiently held our governments to account for, for their failure to uphold those laws, and they're perfectly aware. I mean, you know, it's ridiculous nonsense of Keir Starmer and David Lammy and people pretending they don't know international law when it comes to Gaza, but they know it perfectly well when it applies to Ukraine. Mm. We know, we know the cynicism, we know the double standards, we know the hypocrisy, mm. and the question for humanitarian organisations is, are we, they allied with the people who know that, or are they still trying to hang on to the people who refuse to uphold it? Mm. And I think the only way forward, and it's a way forward that we don't even really have a choice for, because we have to connect this to the struggle for, you know, about climate change, to the struggle against racism and fascism, to the destruction of democracy, the, the wholesale collapse of public, the public sector through neoliberal reform. These are all part of aspects of the same challenge that we face as, as, as a humanity, as a species. And are we going to join together, including humanitarian organisations, join together to build a coalition that's power enough, powerful enough to counter the lobby of the arms industry, to counter the lobby of the fossil fuel industry, of the junk food industry, and of the Israel lobby? Because these are the institutions that are determining our government policy and will determine the policy of the Labour Party if they get into power. Mm. Are we going to do that? Are we going to align ourselves and be part of that larger alliance that is needed to transform our world, because if we don't do it, there is no future for any of us. You know, we'll all experience Gaza's, or we'll all experience the impact of climate change, and we're done for. It, this is the moment where we have to stand up as a species and say, as ordinary people, ordinary citizens, I, I go on the marches, I was on the march on Saturday, you know, hundreds of thousands of people of all ages, backgrounds, whatever, who feel deeply in their heart that something is profoundly wrong in our society and are willing to stand up and take a stand. 
Will humanitarian organizations stand with them? MSF were there, by, interestingly, at the march on Saturday for Palestine. I don't see other NGOs being, being there, but I hope they will consider being there, or I hope they will consider their role and their position profoundly and start to genuinely stand on the side of ordinary people. Can I, can I ask you, and I want to ask Hadil, I want to ask everyone on that question, what does that look like? So when you stand, talk about standing in solidarity, what does that look like from a humanitarian um, uh, perspective? What does solidarity look like? It means saying to the donors, thank you very much, but you can keep your money if those are the conditions you're posing on me. That's where it starts from. And it starts from engaging with the, the public in a genuine way, and it's at all levels. You know, there are, we talk about endless conversations about accountability. There's no accountability to people in Gaza. There never has been. Mm. You know, humanitarian organizations will do what the Israeli government and what their own funders will allow them to do. They will speak about what they're allowed to speak about. They won't speak about what Gazans want, what's important to them, what people in the West Bank, what the Palestinians as a whole want. That's never a consideration. Accountability doesn't matter when it comes to the Palestinians. Palestinians, partnership, participation, localization, none of these things matter mm. because the price is too high in terms of what you're going to get from the donors. So the very first act has to be a willingness to, to find a whole different model, a whole different model that does not involve just becoming an extension of the foreign office in countries around the world. Can I ask uh, Hadida, what do you think, what is, your, what is your response? What does solidarity look like? What does accountability look like in this space, in this moment? I think uh, there, there are two points. The first one is really holding the governments accountable by their people there. So I know that there are so many uh, marshes and so many popular uh, movements, but uh, th there is um, the the there is a, a feeling of urgency because people who are dying under bombardment and out of starvation in the Gaza Strip, they, they cannot wait long. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been going on for months, and um, there is the first uh, reaction of uh, the first uh, instinct of we, there's an urgency for this request. Um, uh, then uh, um, uh, having uh, also uh, the other, the other side of it is, uh, in addition to the urgency, there is the, this um, uh, importance of understanding that th this aid, this money, is your money. Basically, it's the taxpayers' money. This is the money that could actually help communities to flourish. And uh, at the end, we are living on one home. At the end, we have we share this home. The resources that are spent here is is taking taken out from other resources. There is a, a spread of poverty. There is a refugee crisis. That one crisis after the other. That is the creation of the warfare and of the system of. Uh, colonization and oppression and this respect over human rights and not allowing people to live the life they want in dignity. And that feeling that the urgency and the accountability for the taxpayers' own money and uh, for uh, uh, fighting the inequality and injustices that are spread not only between the South and the uh, the West or the North and the South, but it's uh, there is internal inequality in every society that is causing a system that is not working for anyone. And we cannot remove what's happening in Gaza from this system. I, I insist that this is a global crisis, that we as human beings who believe that this is our only home, that we believe we can live together in peace and in harmony, uh, if there is... Uh, more equality and justice in this world, that we can do it. Uh, uh, and that would be our main demand. And I, I totally agree with linking the different um, agendas and different requests because they are actually not different. Mm -hmm. The root causes are very similar and the root causes are the same. Fighting inequality is inevitable so we can have peaceful, more sustainable, more equitable life that is good for everybody. And if we deal with our resources in, a, in an equitable way, we can do it. Mm. And that requires that there is no wars. Mm. Because spending $1 million on a missile that will only kill a family of 20 is not a good use of money, for sure. This can feed 100,000 people somewhere in the world. Mm. Thank you. Karen? Yeah, I mean, just to respond a bit to Jason, we are weighing up all those things all the time, every day. 24-7 and have been for years. 
And when you have staff on the ground, as we do inside Gaza, inside Rafa right now, both international and national, and staff throughout the region, there's a lot to weigh up in terms of uh, their safety and security. So we have to be, we have to use the practice of experience and wisdom that we've learnt through seven decades of engaging with this situation. And that is a fraught and difficult process, and I do not envy our senior leaders uh, the task. Um, but I think also we mustn't lose hope um, because that dishonours the people as well. If, who are we to lose hope as, as agencies that are attempting to inject a degree of humanity into the situation? I, you know, I don't see that in our staff. They are committed, they are compassionate, they believe in a safe and secure world and they will never stop believing in that. Um, I'm sure, but can I just yeah. say, in my experience... Palestinian society, above anywhere else I've worked in the world, are the most alienated from humanitarian organisations, are the most suspicious, who feel that they have done nothing meaningful to change their situation. And all the talk about participation and human rights doesn't matter when it comes to them. And, of course, you know, I entirely, entirely agree and accept that the workers on the ground are giving their lives, literally, to try and help the situation of others but it's not working we, you know gaza has to be a watershed moment in the history of humanitarianism something truly profound has to change it's not going to be shuffling around you know the, the chess pieces a little bit it really has to change on that we completely agree so unfortunately we're out of time but i do think that, that the note to to end on is really about radical change and i think that's what we're all, uh, I think that's what I've heard everyone say, that this is a, that Gaza right now represents a watershed moment, not just for Gaza, something that's relevant really around the world. And is, um, it is a brutal lesson, and a brutal lesson that's been visited upon people who do not deserve it, but it is a lesson that we must learn from um, if we do not wish to repeat it. So I want to thank all of you for being here and for having this conversation. And I hope that it turns into more than conversation because it's beyond the point of chat. It's, it's at the point of, of, of radical change. Thanks so much for being here.